Local Host, in case you don't know why you're here, uh, is a series of monthly technical talks from the Recurse Center community, open to recursors and the general public. As always, we're really excited to see so many familiar faces and to be able to meet so many new folks tonight. If you're not familiar with RC, a quick plug, the Recurse Center is a community-driven educational retreat for programmers located in Soho. At RC, you have the opportunity to direct yourself, to pick projects that you find intrinsically motivating, and to spend your time studying what interests you. People come to RC for six or 12 weeks to focus on becoming better programmers by working on personal projects and collaborating with others. We're free to attend, and we offer need-based living expense grants for people from groups traditionally underrepresented in programming. We also have an integrated recruiting agency which funds all of our operations and gets our alums jobs at great places like Peloton. Uh, who are all of our alums who work at Peloton? Yay! <laughs> cool. Uh, so people come to RC for lots of reasons. To learn things they don't have a chance to learn at their jobs, to immerse themselves in a new subfield that they haven't been part of before, to do original research, to make art and games, and to work on free and open source software. So if you enjoy this talk and your conversations with recursors and what I just said sounds good to you, we encourage you to consider applying for a batch. Uh, with that said, we're excited to be at Peloton tonight and thank them for hosting us. So thank you all very much. <laughs> um, so Paul from Peloton, hey, uh, is gonna say a few words about what they do here. Hey, hey, what's up everyone? Thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, my name is Paul. I'm a senior engineering manager here at Peloton. Um, really excited about tonight's talk. Um, we're hoping to have uh, host more events like this in the future. So thanks for coming out. Um, and thanks, Recur Center, for setting this up. Um, so yeah, a little bit about Peloton. Uh, we sell a bike with a 22-inch tablet on it um, that runs our own custom Android build on it. Um, I think first time I told one of my friends that, they were like, I don't know if that sounds like a good idea, people running around in the city with a huge tablet on it. Probably not a good idea, maybe you wanna rethink that. Um, <clears throat> and I was like, no, it's a stationary bike. So it's a stationary bike. Um, and uh, yeah, so you it's kind of like a bike that has, you know, your private cycling studio in the comfort of your own home. Um, and so yeah, you can stream classes from our studio, which is right here on 23rd, which you can also Go join and check that out. That's uh, a lot of fun. Um, and uh, yeah, you can stream these live classes. There's a huge on-demand library where you can um, you know, join these classes. And there's more than just cycling classes. There's yoga and uh, stretching and things like that. Uh, on the engineering side, uh, we design all the hardware, uh, all the software you see on the, the tablet, on the bike. Uh, we write that, uh, front end, back end services. We have companion apps, uh, iOS, web. Uh, we wrote our own e-commerce platform, so at the heart of it, we're really a technology company too. <clears throat> and so, um, if you're, you know, into fitness technology and, you know, helping people be stronger, um, that's what I'm talking about. Um, and uh, uh, more importantly, live healthier and more positive lives, then uh, don't be shy and uh, come chat to us. Uh, we have a big year coming up, and we need hope, uh, a lot of help from nerds like you. Um, so. With that, uh, thank you again for coming out uh, and coming to Peloton. And uh, can't wait for tonight's talk with David. Cool, okay, so a little bit more boring stuff before David starts. Uh, a quick note about how this talk will run. If you've been to one of our technical talks, you know that we ask that people please hold questions until the end of the talk. Uh, we do this to keep talks time boxed. We also find that when we have a dedicated Q&A session, the questions tend to be of better quality and from a more diverse set of askers. So please write down your questions or just hold them in your head. We're gonna have a two minute break after David talks. He's gonna talk for about 30 minutes. After that, you can leave, chat, stretch, whatever, and then we'll have a Q&A. So without further ado, uh, I would like to introduce David Nolan. He is a software engineer at Cognitech. He is also the lead developer of ClojureScript, a version of Clojure that targets modern JavaScript runtimes. David has been involved in the, was that a woo for ClojureScript? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, David's been involved in the RC community since 2011 and led a multi-hour workshop demystifying the Clojure compiler with the summer 2012 batch, which we still remember and refer to today. Uh, tonight, he's gonna talk about the fundamental principles of software engineering. Get away. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> so this is a new talk. Um, it's not very technical, but you can ask me questions about it. 
Um, this is kind of a high flute and title. It's a bit silly. This talk is mostly a bit of fun. Um, kind of a just, um, I don't know, an experience report on my life as a software engineer um, for, I don't know, past 14 years. All right, so maybe some of you heard about this AI thing. It's getting pretty hot. I, I'm a fan of Go, and so I'm particularly excited about this stuff. So there's this company, well, Google, but DeepMind, they, bought Go they, they got bought by Google. They did this thing called AlphaGo, which is really cool. The first version was cool. It, it beat one of the strongest people in the world. Um, then they built another version that beat the next strongest person in the world. And then they built um, another version, which they didn't have to compete against anybody because it could beat the one that beat everybody else, and that's Alpha Zero. And the reason Alpha Zero is very interesting is because uh, it's a version which doesn't, it has no human input. It doesn't get fed human games. It starts um, simply by knowing the rules. It, uh, it just plays randomly, literally random moves that follow the rules of the game. And in about 72 hours, it can reconstruct uh, the last 3,000 years of human theory about how to play the, uh, the game correctly. Um, so that's way more interesting, actually, than the first the initial versions, because this, this is you know, tabula rasa. And of course, um, Western people, because Western people don't know anything about Go, were like, ah, whatever. And then shortly thereafter, once they proved they could do this in a general way, they were like, well, I bet we could just you know, bust out a version of chess and do shogi. And they made a version that could beat Stockfish. A and really what's astounding about what they've shown is that uh, they can build a neural network uh, which doesn't need to do much computation, right? So Stockfish is looking at 30 million moves a second, and they're only looking at tens of thousands of moves a second, and they can beat it. Uh, so really fascinating stuff, learning. But the big idea is learning. I think we, we there's a lot to learn about learning, um, both uh, in terms of things like AI, but also, I think, for ourselves. That's why I like uh, uh, Go as kind of like a conceptual center for this particular talk. Okay. So there's, there's a really cool book. I want to talk about this book. You don't have to know anything about Go. We're not going to talk about Go, but I really like this book. The reason I like this book is because I, I'm learning. I've been playing Go for off and on for 15 years, but only re really been studying it for about two. And the reason, uh, you know, I'm sure a lot of you have hobbies. And the nice thing about, especially as a software engineer, uh, one of the biggest parts of your job is just learning stuff. Like, I'm, you know, I've been doing it for a while, and I'm still constantly learning stuff and still learning how to learn. Um, and you're always looking for people to work with that can teach you something new or a new place to work where you can pick up new skills. Um, so much of what we do as software engineers is simply about uh, learning. Um, and sometimes I think, you know, um, I wish there were shortcuts. I'm not sure that there are many shortcuts, but you know, sometimes if you have a teacher or a mentor, it can really save you a lot of time. Uh, one thing that I really like about this particular book is it's by this um, uh, professional Chinese Go player. And you know, he d really noticed that Westerners have a real problem picking up the game uh, because Westerners don't have a culture around it. It's the same way the Westerners really identified with Alpha Zero doing chess, but they didn't really get the Go stuff because they know chess, they don't know Go. Um, it's hard to pick up things if you're not sort of immersed in it. I think that's an important part about learning. People think you can pick up a book and learn something, and that's really silly. I mean, some people can do this, but it's a very small group of people that really have the discipline to be able to do this. You really, you know, learning is very much about um, the culture that you're embedded in. But this book is nice. One thing I do like about it, um, as far as Go books go, is that it doesn't pretend you can learn from a book. It just gives you these nice little short statements and boxes. And as the student, you're like, I don't know what that means. I better go play. <laughs> you go play games, and eventually these little boxes make sense. And so I can't give, I can't tell you the real fundamental principles of software, because who knows what the hell that is. But I have learned something in the past 14 years, and I made a few little boxes um, about the things that I've learned, which I think are important. They may not make sense to some of you. Some of them are obvious, and some of them might, might not make sense. And then you can go find out for yourself um, what they mean. OK. Uh, so again, these little boxes. So I've, I've sort of copied this little um, this thing. Uh, learning is a funny thing. Uh, and I definitely think this has been the case for in my career, which is that you start off, you do one thing, and then you do another thing, and you're like, oh, I'm not really advancing, and then you try something else, and, you, and you're like, oh, wow, I, I know a lot more, and things that seemed hard are easy now. And so um, this is actually um, a professional ch Korean Go player talking about, um, I think her name is Tia Gao. She has a, a startup called Elsa, 
where they're using AI techniques to help people learn foreign languages. The AI assistant um, listens to you and then helps you figure out what you're doing wrong. And what they do is they collect all the data about improvement rates, and they've, they've discovered that this is how people learn. People don't learn. There's no this like graph that's going up like this. There's this graph, people plateau, and sometimes that plow lasts, lasts for a really friggin' long time. And then you jump. And then in the post, they talk specifically how important it is just to stick to the thing. And eventually, you know, you'll have an insight. So my career definitely feels like this. I was like, ah, and then, oh, I learned something, and then, you know, like this. And we'll talk about that. Um, the other sort of inspiration for this talk is this, this thing. It's a great post. It's been translated in all these languages because it's so awesome. It's really short. I think it's required reading for anybody who wants to do software. It's Peter Norvig. Um, he's at Google. And he's like, you know, because, you know, in the 90s, and I remember this, during the dot-com boom, it was like, learn XML in 24 hours, learn Java in 24 hours, learn C in 24 hours. And he was like, fuck that. <laughs> you can't learn anything in 24 hours, much less one year or two years. It's silly. It's really silly. It probably takes at least 10 years to really, really know something. If you really want to get into something, it's probably going to take at least that amount of time. Um, but he makes so many amazing points in this very short thing. So much of what he's saying is learning again. He points this out. If you want to learn, it's not about sitting around and reading books. It's about interacting with people. It's immersing yourself um, and sort of sharing knowledge. Okay. Um, and I just want to say, just want to reiterate this point. So, like, there may be some things here that don't make sense. It's okay. Maybe you'll remember this talk in a year or two years, and maybe some of that will make some sense. This is particularly funny. Like, this is like a thing where it's like, I read this, and I was like, I have no idea what this means. And then eventually, like, oh, I'm starting, finally starting to see what he means. Okay. All right. And, and the other thing that I'm trying to do here, which, is, which I, I think I've learned, um, definitely it took me 10 years to learn this, is that, you know, by engaging in this sort of activity and trying to understand how you pick up stuff and how to find people who to interact with or learning how to read papers or deciding you want to go someplace like the Recurse Center or, or finding a place that's very really supportive to mentoring or um, that's okay with like how long it takes to learn things, which is, you know, it's good. Um, and the truth is, is that as, as, as humans, we have this problem, which is that um, most of us are, are fucking lazy. We don't want to learn new things. It's, it's just true. It's just a fact. I don't want to learn new stuff. Most of the time I don't, right? It's just the, the normal state is, I don't want to know about that. Leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, this talk is about how do we counter that? And because there's often benefits. Some, sometimes if you learn something, the most important thing is to share that. And it's amazing how much change or an effect you can have. I mean, certainly the case with the stuff that I've done around UI work. Uh, if somebody had told me that anybody would care about that stuff, um, I would have been completely shocked. You know, I wouldn't believe you. And then it turned out, if you just write a post, maybe people care. Okay. Um, but let's start from the beginning. Everybody has to start somewhere. And you have to start by doing. Doing is important. Um, so I started in about 2005 at the, uh, there was this crazy hype called Ajax. And there's always hypes. Every year there's a new hype. But the hype in 2005 was Ajax. This was... Um, Asynchronous JavaScript and XML, right? Um, people just write JavaScript now. They don't say this word. But this was the hottest thing. And it was because back then, um, writing a web server meant you would have to serialize the session, store that in a database. You would have the response to your request, read out the serialized state, and do something. And then, and it was just a lot of bookkeeping. And then they had this new idea was, that Microsoft Internet Explorer had this feature called XML HTTP request, which had been sitting there for years, but nobody noticed it, um, that you could basically break up the request and break up the work, and you could actually have servers do less work by loading the page once, and then you click on a link, and then a bit of JavaScript um, invokes a, a service API call. And instead of running the whole request, it's just a service API call. You can load a fragment um, and then update the page incrementally. And so the idea here is this was a kind of optimization, not just in terms of how much work the server had to do, but, s but such that the end user experience is much um, better, right? It's, it's a more reactive experience. You don't have to have a full page refresh um, when you click a button, which was prior to Ajax, most websites worked that way. Uh, but there, there is a problem. I mean, this was cool. It's definitely cool. But here's my first thing that I learned about this. I didn't, I didn't understand this when, when I was doing Ajax. I was also 
eating the Kool-Aid, drinking the Kool-Aid. Um, but you know, mainstream software engineering really is pop culture. The people just come up with words, catchphrases, and they, they want to sell it to you because whatever. They're a consultancy, they want to make money, and this is how they succeed. Um, but really, people are just feeding on the fact that main so main mainstream software engineering is a pop culture because what happens is that there is a problem. People are aware of the problem, which is that writing server-side software sucks and handling interactive pages sucks. So Ajax is proposed as the silver bullet that's going to solve that. It doesn't solve that, but it sounds good, and people haven't heard it before. Um, so often, very often, and this is almost you, any technology that comes out, you can apply this. Um, interesting, but very small advance, and normally when it's advertised, um, it's never advertised in a realistic light. Like, what are the actual trade-offs? Um, as we know, I mean, one of the big trade-offs with doing things this way is that you move all state into the client, and now you have very sophisticated clients, very stateful, and now you have to have, which is fine, but that's a trade-off. Now you have to have a much more refined notion of what the front end does. Um, you have to have better tooling around the front end, debuggers, all this stuff that you didn't have to have before move somewhere else. Uh, browsers are now extremely complicated um, you know, pieces of software. And you know, front-end development is very, very, very sophisticated now. Uh, and you know, what happened with this was that uh, you know, there's also something that you often see is when something comes out, people emerge immediately like, identify themselves into camps, and they're all or nothing. Uh, this is the one version of it was TIBCO General Interface. This appeared like, immediately, which was like, let's recreate the desktop in the browser, which is not a good idea. And then the, on the opposite end, you had jQuery, which was um, fine. It was just like, let's, let's, let's remove the differences between browsers. But it added in very little in the terms of higher level constructs so people would, um, without having, you know, without ha if you don't think more deeply about the UI that you're going to build, you can easily make a mess because all jQuery is saying, here is a cross-browser compatible layer over mutable DOM. Good luck. And, um, Fortunately, not everything is bad. I mean, most of the things I'm going to say are, are criticisms or bad things, but not everything's bad. One thing that appeared um, out of this time was Firebug. So something that had happened was that nobody took JavaScript seriously. JavaScript was a joke. Um, some people still think it's a joke. I mean, I actually think it's pretty cool. I like it. But people definitely didn't take it seriously. And actually, no major browser. In 2005, no major browser shipped proper uh, debugging tools. Uh, Microsoft was the closest, but you had to like load Visual Studio and you had to like do all this crazy stuff to get to access to the debugger. And this thing came out called Firebug, which allowed um, web developers to actually debug their web pages in Firefox. And it was actually a good way. You could actually do most of your debugging in Firefox, and occasionally you'd have to like go figure out what's not working in um, Internet Explorer, but almost always that was like, okay, you used the wrong ActiveX plugin. That's what's crashing the browser. Um, and this is something that I see. I mean, what I learned from, what I learned from here is that, is that it's amazing how, um, how not seriously developers, both, both, both end developers and developers of the, of, the, of the software that you use, the browser, uh, people don't take tooling seriously. Um, and it's actually, it's still true today. Like, you know, I witnessed um, many generations of browsers in 2005, and really Chrome is the only one that has really, really, really great dev tools. Safari is okay, and Firefox is okay. Um, it's a very common mistake. Tooling is important. And then I went and after, after that, I did, I did a bunch of stuff. I worked for Princeton University. I worked on a mapping thing. And because I worked on a mapping thing, I then worked for a startup. This was the only first and last startup I ever worked for. Uh, it was interesting. You know, this was a, um, they were based in Portland. They'd raised a couple million dollars from Kleiner Perkins and, and another thing. I don't remember now. Um, but this was like social mapping software, and f unfortunately, they, they had launched, I think, in 2004, and there was 2006 when I started, and then the iPhone came out in 2007. So they were doing, trying to do social mapping before, before the, the, um, the smartphone revolution had taken off, so they ran out of money before um, they were able to move their stuff to iOS. What's funny is that they did sell all their data to Waze, which is, of course, everybody knows Waze. So Waze data was, um, got a huge data set from Playshell. Uh, but the lesson here was that, you know, software startups, they usually fail. And then after, after, after my experience with a failed startup, um, then I went and I was a freelancer again, because I was done with that. And I worked for a museum in New York. 
and I did a project in Django because I'd, I'd been doing a lot of PHP. I did a lot of JavaScript, and I was like, I gotta, I gotta learn something new. This happens to you know, as I've been doing what, three years, three and a half years. I wanted to try something different. Learn some Python. Do do something in anger. Doing things in anger is important. Playing around is cool, but when you have to do something in anger, that's when you actually learn something. So I so I used Django in anger. Um, and you know, Django was uh, Django was cool. Django was cool. There were definitely things about that were cool about it. And I'll talk about Ruby on Rails in a second because I use it in the New York Times. Um, but one thing I learned is that um, it's definitely this was definitely. A, 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 a lesson in abstraction and object orientation, but really it doesn't matter where the abstraction comes from. Uh, there's a high cost, uh, because what happens is that when you, if you want to build an extensible system, you have to pick some abstractions. Um, there's a basically, my theory is there's a 99.999% chance whatever you picked is wrong, um, even though you may think it's right. It's, not, it's, it's right, it might be right for you, but it's gen generally wrong for anybody else. Um, the, the likelihood of making the right choices is depressingly low, so it doesn't matter what doesn't matter what programming language you use. Uh, generally, whatever abstraction mechanism they give you, um, it's a dangerous tool to wield. And I definitely think one thing I've learned is that uh, using that tool is generally not a good idea. Uh, then I tried Couch. You know, a lot of these are my, a lot of these are just my own mistakes. I'm just talking about the mistakes that I made <laughs> learning how to be a software engineer. Then I was like, there was this thing, NoSQL. Everybody should be using NoSQL. You know, Mongo and uh, Couch. There were the two, there were definitely two of the big things. I used Couch. Couch was cool, it was a cool piece of tech, it was a key value store. It has all the problems that all key value stores have, which is you can't write queries. Um, so I learned my lesson there. I built a project that didn't have queries. <laughs> yeah. We don't need to say anything more about that. Okay, after th that, and these were all, th I mean, it's not like, I mean, it's not like these projects did ended badly. The, they all, I mean, they all worked by some, you know, measure of working. People were happy with the results. But certainly from a software engineering standpoint, there was something I would consider to be suboptimal about them. Then I went to work at the New York Times. And that was fun. There was a four years there. And everything, uh, I was on the interactive news team. I worked through the second Obama election. That was a lot of fun. On election night, we delivered 16 terabytes of JSON. It's pretty cool in four hours. Four hours, 16, 16 terabytes of JSON. Um, I think we had, we had, in 2008, when Obama won the first time, they had 20 million viewers on the website. And on and 2012, they had 20 million viewers on mobile. So, so, and the same number on desktop. So that was cool. I also, also learned that Rails is fine. <laughs> That's a lot of traffic and Rails works fine. Well, people complain about it, but I didn't really see the performance thing, problems that people complain about. Um, Node.js, we used a bit of Node.js there because it was starting to get hot. Uh, and what I learned, because I, I did Django, right? You learn Django and you learn all the, the package management and the dependencies and the environment isolation and blah, 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 blah. And then I learned Ruby on Rails. And you learn the package man, the dependencies and the isolation, blah, 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 blah. Then I learned Node.js, the package management, the isolation, the dependencies, blah, 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 blah. And everybody likes to think, oh, we're doing something different. And that's not true. This is absolutely not true. Most software communities are doing exactly the same thing. It's only in their heads that it's different. It's not different. Uh, the other thing I learned was that software, software versioning as a means to manage change is ineffective, right? So at, the, at the New York Times, there were so many times people were like, oh, just use the, til the, 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 the range version. Always, never works, never works. Even, even when you use hard-coded versions, you're like, oh, I'm gonna go from 2.0 to 2.01, and then two days later, then you have working software again. Because it does not work, right? Just doesn't fucking work. People need to stop saying this stuff works, it doesn't work. The other thing I learned at, at the New York Times is that, you know, it was, it was a fairly young, it was a fairly, when I say young, I just mean that like, the average age of the engineers there were probably, you know, somewhere between 27 and maybe 32. Um, so not inexperienced, but you know, still excited about new technology. <laughs> and uh, definitely I learned there that assessing whether a partic particular technology is well suited for a hard problem, it always takes way, way, way longer uh, than you think. Um, this is just true. I've just never seen this to not be true. Whenever somebody's excited about something new, it's always like, 
okay, it sounds good, but really it's going to take you six or eight months to figure out how to actually use it. Um, the other thing I learned at the New York Times is UI software bugs are dominated by state. Actually, that's wrong. Software bugs dominated by state. <laughs> so that, that was big. I mean, that was huge. It's just like we, I did so much UI work over four years, wrote so many, so many news applications for so many news stories, and most of the issues were you know, something, something about state, whether it was in the server side, whether it was in the front end, uh, something about our queues. I mean, who knows? Our caches. State. Sucks. Um, there's, a, there's a really good paper. This, this is definitely a, a, what I would consider a central reading. I, I love this paper. It's um, um, a Rick at Cognitech, and this is one of Rich Hickey's favorite paper. This is, this is one of the few papers that I would swear by. Um, I think if you're a software engineer and you've been doing it for a while, uh, it's a great book. I mean, paper. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a paper that really tries to identify um, where software complexity comes from when you're building a software system. Uh, and they're Haskell programmers, but what they're talking about is not specific to Haskell. You don't have to be afraid of functional programming. Everything they're saying is valid for um, non-functional functional languages. It's good stuff. Um, read it. It's good. This is actually good stuff. <laughs> um, somewhere along there, I, I also took a detour because, you know, I was, you know, I've been, I was coming up on seven or eight years of doing software, and I was like, I gotta try something new, and so I, st or try something different, and I, so I went, was getting back into scheme, and I read this book called The Reason Schemer. This is kind of a detour, but you should check this out. It's fun. I think at the Recurse Center, especially people, people give this book a spin. It's cool. It's very eye-opening, and you know, what I learned was that you know nobody knows anything about programming. <laughs> That's what I learned from that book. Okay, so I, I wanted to do something new. So, so I, I, I kind of reached, the, when I got to the end of the New York Times, I, I really needed to do something different. I, I think it's important. You, you, you do something for a long while, and you just want to try a different way. I, I, I tried a bunch of mainstream technologies, and I wanted to do something different. I'd been using Clojure as a hobby language for about three or four years, four years, no, maybe five years, and I was like, I don't, let, me, let, me, let me try it for, for actual work. And this is actually interesting because uh, it definitely goes back to something I was saying earlier. So I went to work for Cognitech, and they hired me to work on um, do closure projects. Um, specifically, I worked on Datomic, which is an immutable relational database, which is cool. But I also uh, was paid to basically do open source work on ClojureScript. I'd been doing ClojureScript open source work for a long time, but now getting paid to do it. And that's cool. It's definitely uh, uh, doing a big open source project, or big-ish, meaning like, you know, I don't know, there's. 10,000 odd users, I guess, of this. Um, you learn a lot. You learn a lot about, about interacting with people, um, dealing with emotions. I mean, you know, so much of software isn't like writing code, but being polite, being respectful, sharing ideas, trying things, um, inv being inviting, growing the community. There's all this other stuff about software that j isn't just about solving, you know, cool problems. Uh, software is very much about people. There is a side that can be very much about people. And that was, I learned a lot, and still learning a lot from working on this. Um, but what was interesting is the past three years, this is kind of, I'm getting towards the end, I'm almost done. Um, but what I learned is that, you know, so at Cognitech, I'm now on the consultancy side, and I work with a lot of companies. And, you know, I think the last time we checked, I think it's like 15 of the Fortune 50 companies use, and including some in the, you know, the top, the Fortune 10, uh, they use Clojure. A lot of people don't know that. And these companies aren't particularly vocal about the fact that they use Clojure. Um, and it's cool. It's cool. We get to consult with very large companies and small companies. Uh, and you see lots of different projects. And, and the truth is, is that, you know, software project quality is just not dominated by the choice of programming language. So I've seen very nice Clojure projects. It's, they're really great. And you're like, amazing. This is exactly how this language should be used. But to be honest, we're a consultancy, so we mostly get pulled in when people are in trouble. So usually what happens is it's like it's a closure project and it's pretty scary. <laughs> um, so that's really important. People, people, people put a lot of weight into software, into programming language choices. And I'm going to come back to this, and I really don't think it's that important. Um, software quality comes from somewhere else, not, not completely from the programming language. Um, and then I wrote this post. This was actually right at the end of my stint at the New York Times on the way to Cognitech. And this is the case of where like, sometimes you say something and it takes off. And I did this little library called Ohm 
But it really, it was, it, it was a side effect. It was this post that got people excited about React. This is the most blog, popular blog post I ever wrote. I think it got like 150,000 page views in a couple days. And um, it got a lot of people to try React, which is cool. Because the people, from what I could tell, nobody was going to try it because it had XML literals. Um, but it also made me realize that nobody knows anything about programming, right? <laughs> uh, not, meaning even myself, right? I, for me, it was just a hunch. My hunch was I'd been doing UI programming for so long, and I was like, I don't know about this, the, the, what, this MVC thing anymore. Even though we've sort of been running with this idea that had been invented as a memo at Xerox Park in 1979, it was literally a memo. It was like a three-pager, MVC, and then it became a, a cult. Um, and we're stuck with it. I, and I was like, well, maybe there's something else. And that's what was cool about React is React was, there's a different way. There are, a lot, there are definitely a lot of open questions. Again, like, you know, uh, what I, it was so funny to watch people like, okay, I was like, React is a very good idea. It's a very good idea. We have a lot of things, a lot of work to do to deliver on the promise of a very good idea. And then immediately people were like, this is the answer to all of our problems. It's not the answer. It's just a good idea. Um, and, uh, but but the, really the takeaway here was that, you know, for me, it, a, a personal thing that I learned that, that using React and building systems with React, using a functional programming language, is a really dismantled for me. Uh, what people have had sort of uh, adopted is kind of like um, a, tr a truism, that there was a, some deep connection between uh, building UIs and object-oriented techniques. I mean, this was a long-standing connection, mostly because they had arisen more or less at the same time. Um, Alan Kay and his team, at, um, at Xerox Park, developed the original sort of object-oriented programming language, which most object-oriented programming languages copy the basic design. And then on top of that, they had delivered um, UI, modern UI, uh, MVC, at the same time. So people uh, conflated these two things as being sort of kind of closely related. And uh, definitely the last three, four years of doing front-end work with functional techniques, there is no interesting connection uh, between object-oriented programming and UI programming. Uh, so final parting insights, we'll wrap it up. Um, again, uh, something to think about is choice of programming language. I'm only saying this because I, I use a quirky programming language, and so this is an insight I, I can give you that not necessarily we can give you. Uh, programming language is mostly about hiring or hireability. You know, people think it's about something other than that, but really it's just about hiring. They want to be able to hire somebody who knows the thing, um, and you want to get hired. That's the real reason people p uh, pick programming languages. Uh, for people that pick stranger programming languages, mostly about developer happiness. For me, I, I've used other, you know, the mainstream languages, as I, I've used a lot of the popular ones, and I was like, they're fine. You can, you can be productive. But I ended up with Clojure because I wanted something that made me happier. Um, and then definitely, this is true. All this stuff aside, all, what, it doesn't matter what database, your programming language, um, whatever. Um, software project quality is ultimately dominated by people and process issues. Uh, most, of the, most of the problems, when I look at a code base, I mean, it's not like, you look at a code base and if the code base is messed up, it, there's nothing wrong, I mean, it's, it's not actually about the code. It's inevitably about whatever processes are in place at the company. Because it can only get bad in the code if it's bad outside the code. So this is, this is just you know, a fiction. When people say this programming language sucks, I'm like, no, there's something wrong with the process. There's something wrong with the people. Um, that's it. That's not a positive note, but maybe hopefully you learned something. <laughs> So we are going to have that two-minute break that I mentioned earlier. If you want to leave, now is the time. Please don't leave during the Q&A, uh, and then we will be back.
of them are back to the easy, but now it seems like three years. year. Now they're like, you know, we get two beats. Six beats. Oh, yeah, so, so we have doubles. Six beats. Eight years. I don't have to yell. Um, hi. So we're going to start the Q&A okay. in a few moments. Is it working? Good? Cool. Um, we're going to start the Q&A. We have two non-rule rules for the Q&A. One is if you are worried that your question is silly and you don't want to ask it, please, please ask it because it's very likely that somebody else has the same question and they'll be very happy that you did. No silly questions. With that said, there are silly statements. So please think. <laughs> think and reflect on whether or not your question is actually a statement in disguise. You can state things to David later, uh, but please save those and only ask him questions. Cool? So if you raise your hands, I'm going to come around and as soon as he's ready. Maybe. OK. Yep. I think it's good enough. Cool. You second. <coughs> First off, thank you, man. That was amazing, I have to say. It's mad funny. Uh, in the, it was. It was hilarious, obviously. And uh, I just had a question, obviously, about a question, obviously. Uh, the part where you were mapping your learning curves, during the part where you plateaued, did you have a, a strategy to get yourself out of that plateau, and what was it like? I mean, to be honest, I mean, I feel like a lot of times I, you just get bored. I mean, you know, you, you, you can feel that you're not, you're not like picking up anything or you're just like, you are sort of gotten comfortable in what you're doing. So, and sometimes, actually, sometimes in a company you get, pit, like, I mean, it just depends. It depends, like, you know, actually, like, when I was in the New York Times, it, it was very intimidating for me because, like, everybody knew Ruby on Rails and I didn't know Ruby on Rails. I just knew JavaScript. And so they were all experts. And so I felt like I did, couldn't, like, get into the back, do, to do back-end stuff. And that's just a personal thing. I mean, you may encounter that, and sometimes that's just like, if you really want to pick up something, you'd have to like, I want to do something different. 
And maybe your company lets you do that. Sometimes it's not the case, and you go somewhere else. Um, so yeah, you, have, you have to be able to change something up. I, I often find it. If I feel that I'm not learning something new, I generally have to change something. Either that's from my current situation, or I move into a different situation. Um, I was wondering for this talk was very much focused on like people who had been I guess in the industry or working programming for a while. Do you have any way uh, any suggestions on how to frame some of this advice or realizations to people who are like just getting in either like high school students or people who are become like we're just starting to self teach themselves? Uh, I think when you're I mean I think when you're starting out to be honest it's it's like you know it's like as they say for like learning chess or playing Go, just it, uh, when you're really starting out, just do it. I actually think a lot of what I'm saying is mostly for people who have done it for a little, a little bit of time already, because then you can sort of see what I'm saying. You get a sense of what I'm talking about. But if you're just starting out, don't worry about all this stuff. Just, just, just write code. <laughs> uh, hi, thanks for the talk. Um, I have a question which is kind of related to, or I don't know, my thought was prompted by uh, the Tar Pit paper that you recommended, which I looked at years ago, I'm gonna look at it again. Um, but yeah, so I've been thinking lately about just like energy usage, right? I don't know if folks have seen the reports that like Bitcoin uses more electricity than Ireland and like all kinds of outlandish stuff. So like as I, as I just think about like where software is going, obviously a lot of things that are happening now can't continue in indefinitely. And I'm, I was just wondering if you have any thoughts about, about that. Like do you think programmers are gonna think more about like electricity and energy usage and stuff like that than we do now? Or yeah, just general future thoughts? I mean I definitely think that, I mean if, you're if the question is more about sustainability, I don't see how, yeah, I mean I think sustainability is extremely important and um, I definitely think a lot of the, the tech stuff around sustainability or software initiatives around sustainability, all that stuff's really cool. Um, I, I, I see it as being important, but I, I don't know enough about it to say more than that, really. Hi. Uh, you talked, uh, you kind of compared uh, Go professionals with software engineers and uh, proceeded to uh, uh, talk about machine learning, that how machine learning is more efficient at playing Go than uh, Go professionals now? Was this like a big metaphor on how machine learning is going to be more efficient on writing software? Uh, I don't know if that's true, but it's something to watch out for. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think there are, there are some other hurdles to um, cross before uh, they, can, they, can, they could do that. You know, I mean, one, I think there are a lot of challenges. Definitely there's a lot of challenges. I mean, I'll, I'll be more afraid. So DeepMind is working on StarCraft too, right? That's the so when they can deal with incomplete information and unknown parties, like true, like multiple unknown system, like inter interacting systems, then I'd be like, okay, maybe, maybe we should start getting worried. But right now, go, it's total information, chess, total information, it's cool. Um, but it is something to think about. It is something, that's definitely something to think about. There are two parts to think about. One is, you know, which, but, but there's also opportunities. As software engineers, you could be like, there's this stuff that we used to do that's automatable, that we thought wasn't automatable. I mean, there's a whole suite of things that people were doing in the past that you could possibly automate now, um, like restricted domains where automation is possible. Um, but then there, of course, I mean, I think people should be concerned as, as that approach becomes more sophisticated and can cover more ground, I think humans are gonna have to be like, well, maybe we need safeguards for like what is allowed. I mean, that's definitely true. Right here. Hey, thanks again. Um, one thing that you didn't touch on, but maybe I know the answer because nobody knows anything about programming, is um, about type systems. Um, and it seems like most of the, your experience has been with dynamic languages and leading up to Clojure uh, and Clojure Script. <coughs> and you mentioned also, you know, most of the time as a consultant, you kind of go into these Clojure disasters, maybe, right? Um, and your experience is is part of that because of TypeScript, because that would be one argument on that side, you know. And I just wonder how that plays into the complexity, and is it, is it the hype that types are really that great? Especially when you think about functional programming where some people think, oh, you gotta have types with functional programming. I mean, most of the messes that I've seen are, have nothing to do with types. I mean, it's like somebody, they don't, they don't have CI set up. Uh, they don't have the proper type of testing set up. Um, they're using um, an AWS service that doesn't make any sense. They have a Kubernetes cluster for no reason. They're using <laughs> Kafka for no reason. I mean. They've chosen Cassandra for no reason. 
This is, this is what you see. Like people talk about types and I'm like looking at their freaking system, their system and it doesn't work. It doesn't matter if there's a type system or not. If you were using Haskell and you built like that mess, it's gonna still be a mess. Okay, it compiles, who cares? Um, I'm interested in the connection between two, two of your statements in the talk. You, you said that tools are underappreciated and I, I really appreciated that comment. Um, and then at the end, I was very intrigued by your, your comment that problems in the code reflect problems outside the code. One thing that I've noticed um, working in the software industry is the way in which there's this funny interplay of software sort of reifying the bureaucracy of an organization. And I'm thinking in particular about um, the tools we use to develop software. So ticket, you know, bug tracking and project management software and that kind of stuff. I'm curious about your thoughts about the interplay between, on the one hand, like the, the code problems being, com you know, interpersonal problems or, or sort of people problems, but then also the impulse of programmers to try to take their people problems and like use software to solve them. I mean, so I, I'm sympathetic to people who, I mean, I am sympathetic to business concerns, right? One, one, one huge issue that you're always gonna have, and especially in larger scale software projects, is who is doing what and how long is it taking? Um, I mean, there's, there's a tension here because the truth is, is that often software tasks are much more complicated than they seem, but how do you explain the, 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 the finer details of that in a way that makes sense? And so to me, I see, uh, a lot of the ticketing systems is like uh, a, a kind of compromise, right? There must be some way to make visible what it is that's being done. Um, I, I don't know, there's, to me there's no answer to this problem, right? You have technical engineers who are trying to accomplish what they believe is the business goal, and there needs to be some way for the people who are concerned about the business goals to track progress. Um, I don't know, I, this is to me is like, People constantly think they can make that better, and my, my, I'm just like, it's not, it's never gonna happen. It's never gonna happen. Hi, I, um, so I was really intrigued by your uh, point about code quality problems being reflected by like system problems and interpersonal problems. Um, I was wondering if you had any like process points that you think lead to better software, like the most important bits of process and the most important important parts of interpersonal interactions that you think are essential to building good software, and if that's too high level and generic, uh, some battle story of bad code and how it was uh, inflated by some poor piece of process problem. Does that make sense? Boom. It, do it does make <laughs> sense. So it's, it's funny. I actually think like, you know, you know, it's like there's this thing that, there's this thing, there's this, uh, like I think, I, I'm sure most of our seers agree, but like the code of conduct thing is actually a great idea. Because I used to teach, I used to, te I used to be a substitute teacher and I used to teach elementary school kids. And you need, you need rules, right? You need basic rules. I mean, the people, like these little kids, they need to have enough room to play and learn, but you need a structure. You need a structure in which they can learn and they can grow. This is absolutely true in software. There needs to be structure and rules. Right? And so in a software project, who, who, who's following the progress of developers? That person should be technical. That person should be able to look at somebody's code and say, let's do it this way. Let's do it, let's do it slightly differently. Or this is not the right way. Or you take somebody who's, who's fresh and you pair them with somebody who, um, um, who's more experienced. And the culture should be one that's uh, sort of accepting of that, right? You have to have a sensible, like, like set of, ba of rules and boundaries and things that allow people to be successful. Uh, but often when, when I come into a project and, and I see that, that it's not succeeding, somebody is like, you know, thinks they're a rock star programmer, it's almost never true, and, um, but somebody believes that or a few people believe that, they're, let to, they're allowed to do whatever they want, they have no accountability, the manager's afraid to say anything, their manager's afraid to say anything, and then of course what you have doesn't work. <laughs> Because there's no, there's, no, there's no structure in place. There's no guidelines for anybody to follow, right? This, this, this is, I mean, that's, that's been my experience. I mean, you may have a different experience, but my experience has been, I've seen this in multiple companies, that when something's really bad, the code's really bad, something like this is happening. 
first of all, amazing speech. So thank you very much for that. Um, but second of all, how would you go about transitioning from a less syntax heavy, higher level language, or like something like Python, to a more syntax heavy but lower level and faster language like Java or C++? Because I took a look at Java after like a bunch of time on Python, and I was kind of scared away because it looked because suddenly you went from like print with parentheses to like sys out ln or whatever it is. So how would you recommend going about doing something along those terms? Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. I mean, certainly, yeah, I mean, it's a great question. Um, I mean, what my experience with like one book that I really loved, like when I started out, when I was well not started out, but when I got back into programming, I, I used two books. One was SICP, which was Lisp, and it was so high level. Another one was the KNRC book. And especially with, I think, like, these traditional C-like languages, if you can find a really good, succinct book, and then you build and you start doing some small things, um, you can have a lot more fun. Like Java is a big, complicated language, but inside of the big, complicated language, there's something that's pretty simple, and it's pretty fun to use. And you can find it if you have, I think, a good starting point. I, uh, one thing that I would recommend, especially with somebody like Java, is find a tiny project where they haven't written five million classes and five million interfaces, it does one thing, and then like, edit it, do a pull request, and I think you can learn that Java can be cool and simple. Um, I think that's the, the really, that's, that's the key, is find, find the part of the language that's simple and focus on that. Hey, uh, you mentioned in one of your uh, uh, slides about uh, the difficulties with uh, abstractions, uh, and I wondered what you thought, what are some ways to uh, either counter that or deal with that? Yeah, so that was kind of a was kind of a bold statement. It was a bit short. I mean, so a, a lot of that comes from, um, I mean, if you really think about how non-trivial system soft systems work, you almost have disparate systems, and you have to pass messages, right? And you have some you proto protobufs or JSON, some generic interchange format. But there's no abstraction. That's just some data. I sent data from point A to point B. And if, you're, if, if your whole system looks like sending generic messages from point A to point B, then why is all your code interfaces and all these abstractions when, when all the non-trivial interactions are very simple messages? So all I'm suggesting here, my statement is that um, by engaging in unnecessary abstraction, you often box yourself into a corner when typically you could just be like, let's move data even within, our fun even within same process boundaries. Um, this is why I think JavaScript, as much as people rail on JavaScript, I mean, the fact that like a lot of JavaScript is passing JSON data around. Like, the, and the fancy JavaScript tools, right? The, fa the fancy JavaScript tools, Babel, it represents the entire SST, AST as JSON, right? JSON is a pretty fine format for moving, doing non-trivial stuff. Um, but you look at Java compilers and they make types for everything. Right? And, and, and you look at the effectiveness, and I would say it's not clear to me that there's, there's any more effectiveness in the Java approach other than it's harder to understand, it's harder to change your mind. So I, 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 there's not a direct answer, but I say look at the evidence of like how systems are actually built. Um, so one of the reasons you mentioned that people choose a particular programming language is developer happiness. Um, so what aspects of a language do you think have the biggest impact on developer happiness? I, you know, I, for me it's like, um, often you pick a language, so what do you want to do? You, to me, to me, pick a, I mean, of course the first thing you do is, the, you don't pick a language because like, I want to, I mean, maybe you, some people do, but I would say you want to be a data scientist, so learn Python. You want to, you're really excited about UI, so do JavaScript. You know, you're really excited about doing iOS, you learn Swift, right? right? Your goal should be, what is the thing that makes the most sense for what I actually want to do? That, that, that's what I'm trying to say. And then what happens is that you may, you, you'll get experience, and then you may decide, I want to I see a different way of doing it, and you try a different programming language. But I would say if you, you know, I definitely would say if you're, if you're trying to pick something, I would say, what is it that you actually want to accomplish, and pick the right thing for that. Um, so, uh, you mentioned earlier, like this idea of uh, you know most people don't want to learn new things. I definitely identify with this. Like, you know, whenever I, I see something, there's this tension between 
um, you know, your desire to like dive into the new thing and your resistance to like, you know, really understanding it deeply. Have you gotten better at um, knowing when to listen to that and say like, no, this is just, this is not fundamentally like um, different from what I know or uh, no, uh, this is, um, j this is like an indirection, a detour from, you know, the, the, the things that I'm trying to learn. Like how, how do you, ha like, does that instinct ever, is that instinct ever helpful and do you get better at like utilizing it? I, I think that often what you have to do is you have, if you, have, you have to wait until, I mean, so sometimes, to me, when something isn't working, it can't just be you that believes it isn't working, right? You have to have other people who, who, who have come to the same conclusion. You're building a system and you're all working on the system and you're like, gosh, this isn't working. And you collectively come to an agreement that isn't working. And at that point you start saying, let's consider some alternatives. Is there, is there a way, is there a thing that we can all agree upon that could possibly solve this problem in a better way? And then you go assess some things. But I think that, um, you know, all this stuff boils down to communication, right? This is what I think about what we're doing is not, I don't feel like it's working. And then you, you know, corroborate the information with somebody else's experience. And then you can start, you know, fixing the problem. Uh, but, you know, sometimes what you see is that, like somebody thinks something isn't working and it may be true, it may not be true, right? It really depends on the company, the team, um, whether, you're on the same page. But I would say you have to get people to be on the same page. You know, so it's very often that I, that I go to something and then sometimes people don't know. Sometimes all you have to do is like, hey, don't you think this is messed up? And people are like, yeah, I've, I've been thinking that. You, you think it's messed up too? <laughs> so that, the first step is just being like, vocalizing, I think this is not optimal. And often people don't do that. I mean, it's shocking. Like, you work on a project and people are going, and they're like, I can't believe you wait five minutes to see any, every, every time you change something, it takes five minutes to see something. And they're like, yeah, it kind of sucks. <laughs> like, well, then you're like, I have an idea. And they're like, really? <laughs> so uh, identifying problems and, 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 and getting buy-in that that is a problem, I think, is the very first step to like making something better. I, I mean, I hope that answers your question. It's not an easy answer, but, uh, but that's what I think. Hi, uh, I liked your boxes. Um, do you have any ideas that would go in a box on the subject of concurrency within a program? Concurrency within a program. I mean, it's scary. I don't know. I <laughs> know. Uh, I, I mean, I don't. I mean, I, I mean, what, 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 what is there to? S I mean, is there something more specific? Not necessarily specific, but like they're like on a high level, like abstraction via whatever means could kind of like run into problems where there was like a box sort of on that note. Um, I was wondering if there was like any like pearls of wisdom on like dealing with concurrency in a program as to like maybe approaches or like certain problems definitely will happen. Um, I mean, to me, like I, I, I'm, I'm not number one. I wouldn't. I'm not a concurrency expert, but I, I sort of here. I, I, I just defer to the authorities on this subject. Like, you know, the books that I like are like, you know, I like, I like the ideas about Erlang, right? So if you're going to build a non-trivial system and concurrency is big, I like the ideas. And if you're going to build a system, maybe you should think about that. Another one, if you're doing like C plus plus or Java, uh, the, the sort of gold standard in that world is Java concurrency in practice, which is like talks about. Java's memory model and what's guaranteed in the presence of multiple threads. And it's like, these are all the things that can go wrong. It's an, it's an amazing book. Um, if you're going to do that type of programming, that seems like essential reading. Um, and then, of course, you can pick languages that just hide that problem, right? There's, and this, I mean, people complain about JavaScript, but there is a beautiful thing about JavaScript where it's like, we just have multiple processes and we don't care. Or you do closure and you can do shared memory concurrency, but you don't care because you have higher managed concurrency primitives. Um, you know, Either, either, either read some books for the f if you if you're in a scary world like Java, or pick a technology that solves it for you. Cool. Thanks. Hi. Um, what's your, your view on software testing? Software testing tests are good. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, in my experience, like people rave about code coverage and testing, but. It seems really hard to write 
good tests and nine, and nine times out of 10, if your test breaks, it's because the test is bad and not because your code is actually bad. So, so, that's, so the main problem here is that people don't realize that tests are code and that code quality matters as much as in a test as it does in the code. So I think a lot of times people think testing is an extra thing, but really testing is something that must be maintained, it must be well written, it also must be understandable. Um, and it, you have to understand the amount of time it's going to add to whatever projection you have about the effort that's involved in a task. Um, but testing is important. How, I mean, how can you know that something's going to work if you don't do a certain amount of testing? Um, I like unit tests, makes sense. I don't, I, I don't really like code coverage. This idea that every line of code is covered, I, this, this does not make any sense to me. But the idea of writing unit tests, um, when something breaks, writing unit tests for that. Um, I believe in um, integration tests. You have a CI server. Every time somebody pushes to a branch, CI server runs, and does the system still work? This is very useful, right? Smokescreen testing. Um, I believe, uh, I'm not a huge fan of UI-based testing. I mean, people do have all these crazy things, uh, but I do believe in QA. Whenever I've worked on projects where we had a QA person or Q multiple QA people, it's really great to be able to push something and people have a th set, of, set of things they go through and they catch bugs. Um, but um, I think testing is good. I, I definitely, I'm definitely just not a fan. When people go very far with it and very religious about it, I don't relate to that. It seems to be an undue amount of effort and the, the returns be dim start diminishing. Um, you describe Datomic as an immutable database, and I have no idea what an immutable database could be. Uh, could you explain that? Yeah, yeah. So Datomic is, uh, it's, it's, so Cognitech is a consultancy, but as a product, Datomic is a closed source database that we sell, and it's, um, it's an immutable relational store, meaning that all it does is that um, there's sort of the theory of persistent data structures where you have these multi-way branching trees. So like, if you want to update something, you find out where the tiny piece of that data lives and you just replace the entire blob. So if you think about Git, how does Git work? Git is a, a history of the, of the file structure. So Git doesn't record deltas, right? When you change a file, it says all the pointers point to all the old files except this one pointer to the new blob. So Datomic says, well, what if you did that as a database? And we, we record all of your data into these tiny chunks and we insert into key value stores. You maintain indexes and when you want to update one piece of data, we find the segment that has it. So what this means is that we, we have a database over high performance key value stores that works like Git in the sense that you can run queries at any point in time. Same way that you can go to a parent in Git, this parent tree, and then you can look at what the file structure looked like then. It's that we give you queries and we have indexes over, over the past. So um, full disclosure, I'm a recruiter. Um, I have a question about recruiting engineers. So um, what if you're talking to a great engineer and they're dead set on working with one language? Um, how would you like sell your company or, or your project um, on the technology that your company is working with potentially? Um, I, I, that's an interesting question though. I, I do think it's strange when an engineer is dead set on one language. It seems unusual. Um, yeah, so some people like they want to work with Ruby or they want, we work with Python so it's great if anyone works with Python here. But, you know, um, yeah, so like um, for, for back end, maybe someone only wants to work with Go or something like that. Um, you know, maybe you wouldn't even want to talk to that person is, is one way of looking at it. Uh, it. I mean, to me, it really depends. I mean, so one thing that I think is that, you know, I always like, I, I really try to come up with my own ideas here. Like you have somebody like Google, right? Google has like these accepted set of languages that they're willing to support. Python, Java, C++, and I guess now Go and JavaScript, of course. So those are like, and actually Common Lisp, because they bought ITA, so Common Lisp as well. Um, but, they, but for every language, they, 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 say, they say as a company, you, you're not gonna just bring on somebody in isolation, you're gonna say, okay, we're gonna bring on somebody, and let's, talk, let's start talking about as a company, is this something that we're okay with, and what are the processes and procedures in place, what are the rules that will allow this to work that everybody feels comfortable with, right? Hiring somebody and just having them do their own thing, it can't be good for you, it can't be good for them because they won't feel any support and you won't feel like they're doing anything that's in line with what you want to do. But you can think of a different situation where like, well, we need microservices and we're not going to allow anybody to do anything 
But really, a lot of our hirees that we, that we interview like Go. Let's have, a, let's have a conversation about Go. Would everybody be okay with, we're gonna start having a couple people on, that know Python that are not against Go, learning Go. And then we're gonna have a process and a set of guidelines around Go. And then now you can hire those people. And that to me seems like a perfectly reasonable path, if that's what you wanna do. It may be the case that that's not in scope or time, money, whatever. What are your thoughts on Reason? Reason's super cool. I know, I know the Reason developers. Um, it's great. I, have, I mean, it's really, really, really cool. I hope, I hope something like that takes off. I mean, um, I think there's actually, I mean, you know, the, jo like the front, end is e front end is eating the world. So if there was ever a chance for an ML-like language, like you know, when I say ML, I mean like standard ML OCaml, uh, to take off, it would be in the front end. So we'll see. I'm sorry? You know, like, reason's like a JavaScript way to do ML. Like, JavaScript exactly, it's a very JavaScript-centric way to do ML, which I think is super cool. It's super cool to have that in closure script. Like a binding to reason. <laughs> 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 that, that could be interesting. JavaScript to closure script. Yeah. Hi, um, thanks for the talk. <laughs> your, uh, your point about abstraction usually being, you know, usually choosing the wrong abstraction resonated with me. And I've noticed that some languages out there, like, I would say that Go is one, and I would say that Elm is one. Um, seem to, it seems that the people who are creating those languages have consciously decided uh, that there are some ideas out there that give you the power, powers of abstraction, and they're just not going to build those ideas into the language, like type classes or generics. They're just like, we don't think these are valuable. We don't want people to abstract. We think that if we put these in the language, people would bike shit about them too much. Are you a fan of languages like that? I mean, with Elm, it's hard. It's hard. It's harder for me to say because Elm is not really was designed to be general purpose. Like it's only for the front end. They, in fact, they have no story yet for the back end. And given given its narrow domain, um, I can I can completely understand um, Evan's viewpoint. Given given that it's a, for a very specific task, which is writing front ends, that lack of abstraction power doesn't seem to be much of a hindrance. I mean, people are very productive with Elm, and they don't they're not complaining about missing type classes because they're able to do what they actually want to do, which is write UIs. Um, Go, it's harder to say, because Go is sort of marketed as a general purpose language. And um, you know, I definitely, while it's hard, right? Like, the way, the way programming languages work is that you often provide you know, a foot gun, because yeah, 1% of the time you do actually do need the foot gun. It happens, or you just need it. <laughs> You just need it. I mean, every language just provides foot guns because occasionally you need it. I mean, my suggestion isn't to remove. I mean, I understand why programming language designers say remove stuff, you, remove stuff like that. But the truth is, in, a re, in the real world, 1% of the time you need that stuff, and it's really useful. It's really useful. All I'm suggesting is that people should know that it's a foot gun, and everybody should know, like, hey, I'm about to use the foot gun. And somebody says, stop. <laughs> right? That's what I want people to do. Hi, great talk, thanks. Um, so in the progression of your career, I'm curious if you've ever thought about like ethical reasoning in software and where ethics is kind of placed in the fundamental principles of software for you. I mean, ethics is it's really important. I mean, it, I think it's, uh, it's definitely, it's already super important. I mean, it's already super important. I, mean, I definitely think that like um, the current sort of I would say, I mean, I would just call it fallout from like social networks. Like really you sort of see that like um, there are unforeseen impacts um, for the way that software works. Um, and they really have a, a dramatic effect on people's lives in a big way. Um, and I think that as, as, as more and more people become software engineers, and I really don't see, I mean, you know, I don't really see uh, this ending anytime soon. Yeah, I think, I think, I think as an engineer, you have to be, uh, I mean, I, uh, of course I would, I mean, my background's in film. So I'd be like, everybody must take a class in the humanities, you know? <laughs> of course, that's my, that's my opinion. But I really do think that ethics, ethics, like engineers should have to take an ethics course. I mean, it's so, it's so important. I mean, like, I mean, right now, if we were just talking about security and privacy, like that, those two topics alone, everybody should be, should understand. But certainly as we start building um, 
uh, as, uh, you know, I think in the next 10 years, it'll be very normal for an engineer to know how to train basic models. And to have some understanding about um, ethics around that is going to be, I, don't, I just don't see how it wouldn't be important. Uh, you mentioned that uh, React is a good idea. Have you come across any other good ideas recently? I've been, I've been pretty heads down. I mean, to be honest, I, I haven't seen anything that's like uh, very recently that's, oh, I did, there was a cool paper, but it was an AI paper. There was, there was an AI paper and a guy was getting passed around this week where it was like, they had, um, um, it was like, models are better than indexes. Yeah, that's really cool. So they were, they were training a model and its performance characteristics were better than like a bloom filter, right? Like, like they could train the model and the performance characters were better. That sort of stuff, using, using um, this, this sort of optimization technique by training models, I mean, I think that's definitely gonna have huge, huge repercussions. I mean, another place that I think people, I mean, there's a lot of obsession around deep learning, which it's totally cool, deep learning is totally cool. But also there is, I mean, I think as time moves on and uh, real, -time, real time stuff becomes more and more important, where you may not have enough data. Uh, there's a bunch of research, especially in you know, the Numenta people, they, they, they're trying to do this thing where you have a live feed of data and can you train a system on demand? Like you, you don't have that much data, can you train something? So that I think, so these two things I, I definitely, I, I, super, gonna be really big. And I, and I really do believe that people will consider this stuff normal techniques. They won't consider these to be esoteric. More questions? Last chance? Going, going, gone? Cool. Thank you all so much. Thank you, David. <laughs> and thanks again to Peloton for this wonderful space and the food. You're gonna hang out for a little bit? Okay, so if you wanna talk to David, if you have s statements saved up, uh, he'll be here for a little bit. Uh, we gotta get out of here by around nine. Sonali will probably be organizing a group to go out for drinks. <laughs> no, she won't. <laughs> we'll figure it out. Um, in any case, thank you all very much for joining us. Uh, local host is over until 2018, but our next local host talk is in January, uh, so not too long to wait. Uh, it's going to be on January 23rd. We don't know where or what yet. Mysteries abound. Uh, we will have them hopefully every month in 2018, so please keep an eye out for those. And thank you all so much again for joining us. <laughs>